My name is Jonas Karlsson. I work here at Google. Uh -huh. And uh, I'm very happy to, uh, to introduce my professor, uh, Tore Risch, here uh, from Sweden. He um, has somehow, um, or somewhat, a um, Silicon Valley history. He uh, used to be at HP Labs in the a database lab there. Um, did very interesting work on uh, kind of object relational database system and main memory database systems. And uh, he has also been part of a number of startups in AI and, um, and uh, knowledge management. And, uh, and now he's a professor in uh, Uppsala in Sweden, database lab. Uh, formerly, he was in Linköping. And, uh, um, he learned me a lot about databases, especially database implementations. So if you're really interested in that, you can have a really good discussions about that afterwards or whatever. Um, so um, this is a talk which is recorded for an open audience of Google Video. So please be careful with what questions you ask. So don't ask anything confidential. Uh, we will have an um, ability to ask those questions after the talk is finished if you have anything. So just be careful about what you mention. And with that, I let Tura have the floor here. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. Yes, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, a project, uh, actually two projects that we have been working on recently. And the title is Customizable, Scalable uh, Compute Intensive Stream Queries. Uh, this talk is mainly based on the first publication here with me and Milena Ivanova. Uh, it was in VLDB conference in Trondheim, which was sponsored by Google, I think. <laughs> and uh, that's the main part. Uh, now, Milena has moved over to, to Holland to CWI, and we are continuing. Uh, it's a, a follow-up project uh, with Eric Seitlin. I will mention a little bit about what you're doing there, but this is more ongoing work, the second one. Okay, so... Uh, this has been uh, recognized a lot recently that uh, we have new uh, data intensive applications. And where data is not stored on disk as they are in uh, regular relation databases, but they come in large streams. And, and what we have been particularly interested in, like satellite data or, or uh, space data, scientific data, you have, you have things like different kind of measurement de devices that, that uh, manipulate this data coming down. Patient monitoring, stock data, process industry, and traffic control are other examples. But we are mostly interested in the scientific part, so it's the first part here. And the interesting thing with these new kind of applications is that data come in streams rather than being stored on disk. And these streams can be big. So uh, then uh, there's been a lot of interest in doing something called a data stream management system. You know, we talk about database management system. A data stream management system is something which is actually rather similar to a database man uh, management system, but it is also different. And this picture is actually a modification of the major textbook on uh, databases, in fact, but it's now instead of the database management architecture, it's data stream management architecture. So. Uh, on the top, it is the same. You know, we have users and programmers, and they post queries to the system. As not SQL, maybe something else. And then you have this big piece of system software called the Data Stream Management System, or the DSMS. And it has some software to process queries. And if it had been a database management system, there would be a lot of, of software to process disk. <laughs> but here, there is instead software to access streams. And exactly as a database management system, you input some metadata, a schema. And the input, basically what it does, it, it uh, accesses streams, and the result of a query in the relation database is a table. Here, the result of a query is a stream. So stream in, stream out. So it's, it's rather similar, but actually different. Now, you want to see what kind of applications we have been looking at. And I've been you know, in Sweden for a while, and, and I've been looking for real, kill, I mean, real <laughs> challenging applications. And really, we got it in Uppsala, where they have a lot of physicists. So this is what they're doing in Holland. They are building the first in the world all software radio telescope, no moving parts. Huh? <laughs> Instead of having these big steel things, you know, what they are doing is they're putting out a lot of transmitters in this, um, in this pattern here. Every dot here is a, is a transmitter station. And there's, there are some, there's some software and hardware over there, and it receives data in all directions from space, collects it into fast uh, Ethernet cables, and it all collected into a central processing unit in Groningen, in northern Holland. And, and uh, so now the, the stream rate here is pretty enormous. It is 20 
terabits per second altogether, and they uh, really needed a good computer. So they bought one of those blue jeans, IBM blue jeans, and, and that's what we're running on actually these days. <laughs> Um, and actually, it is not even a standard uh, blue gene. It is a specially configured IBM blue gene for handling large stream volume. Because the blue gene is really for number crunching only. And here we want to deal with streams. And what we have been working on here now, and, and now you can actually see what the scientists are doing, the astronomers are doing. They're looking for phenomena, you know, things happening up there. And what they basically are doing is that they are putting filters on the streams. I want to see when there is this kind of solar storm or something. Yeah? And so th this can be seen as a stream query. If, but the way you express the queries is rather different from, from SQL because you have these rather advanced filter operations. And the astronomers know how to do that. It has to be possible to plug them in. And it is also very challenging because there are many computers involved. There are several clusters involved. And, and it's an enormous amount of data. And it's much more fun than just business data from our point of view. Yeah? Uh, and here's the reason we came into it because there is a associate project called the Lewis Outrigger in Sweden. <laughs> so the physicists in Uppsala, they have been setting up, they're making, they were specializing in antennas. So they have special kind of, these are software, all software antennas where you can program the direction where they are sensitive. By the way, this telescope, you know, so you, you program the lens in software and then you can actually program the direction because if you want to look in a certain direction, there's going to be a, a difference in, in, in time. There's going to be interference between. So you can program direction. So you can actually say, I want to look in that direction. And then you can look more carefully there. And similarly, in fact, these antennas, you can program in different directions. They're all software and directed. So uh, anyway, so they, uh, this is connected to the, it is in co collaboration with the, with the LUFA project. And they are actually have set up this antenna. This is a real photo, in fact. And this data is being fed out into the internet in, as a UDP stream. And we are actually been querying this the UDP stream. And there's some so hardware in there to do that. OK. So now the first thing to do is to look at requirements. Well, first, uh, uh, the real challenge here is the scalability. Because the data volume now suddenly is something we have never seen before in the database world. You know? In fact, the insert rate is pretty high. In, in a relation database, you know, it's for business. Yeah, you want to insert uh, quite a lot of records and you want to uh, access them pretty fast. But it is not at all this rate we're talking about. The data volume is much bigger. And one uh, effect of this is now you can talk about even in stream databases. Why don't we just uh, store the stream on disk? But you know, in this case, no, it is too much. Data has to be reduced before it can be stored on disk. And another thing is you cannot, uh, well, this is true for all stream database management systems, that you cannot query, the, do join in the regular way. Instead, you have to look at pieces of the stream at a time. That is what's called moving windows. So you, you always look at windows that slides over the streams. And that's where you make the queries. And that's uh, how it works. And then on these streams, one, one apply different kind of filterings. And the filterings are, well, there are regular filterings like, like you have relation databases, but there are also special kind of filterings that are uh, made by the astronomers, you know, to do the signal processing of different kinds, signal reduction algorithms. And you also do combine. Very important here is actually join, because what I said, you know, when you aim the, the telescope, you, you look at difference in time of the signal, of the stream, from, from, different, uh, from different directions. And uh, also, uh, the most filtering reduction combination has to use user defined functions. It is not enough to just have a set language, like in SQL. And it, also, it has to be scalable with respect to data volume. But the problem is that these algorithms they have for combination and filtering, they're rather expensive. So it has to scale when you have expensive computations, too. If you have a relation database, the computations you're doing are very small. You know? It is comparison of, of, of different kinds. Uh, and indexing is the main thing. But here we also have rather expensive computations being done in real time on the streams arriving. So this is requirements, or requirements. So what we did then, then and this is the first, uh, this is the main part of the talk, and that's the BLDB paper, something called the Grid Stream Data Manager. It basically is a stream data management system that is specialized for very high volume scientific data. And as other stream database management systems, you define continuous queries over them, filter conditions. And you allow user defined functions, very important, because you have to be able to plug in your own C code. Now, to get the performance, this is a parallel or distributed system. You can, you can, uh, it is not running on one node, it is running on many nodes, arbitrary number of nodes. And uh, they can communicate with each other and the system can dynamically start new nodes or even kill nodes. You know, it's completely dynamic, so it's a dynamic architecture. 
And what I will, uh, what the paper was mainly about was how do you define the computation in such a distributed uh, and parallel environment? And what we have is a little, uh, uh, is a way called data flow distribution templates. It's a way of, for a given algorithm, you know, foreign functions have been used in databases for a long time. So you can easily define your own, your own code in C and then use the queries. But the problem is if you want to parallelize it, you also want to tell the system how to parallelize an algorithm. And this depends very often on the algorithm. And I will talk a little bit more about that. So there has to be a way to customize the parallelization as well. And that's what data flow distribution templates are about. And of course, in order to get the performance we need here, the, the, the engine itself has to run in main memory. There is not time to save on disk. Yeah. So here's the scenario how you use the system. So you are a scientist to the right here. And um, the scientist talked to some kind of a client program. And we'll get the result back of the query normally as a visualization program. You don't want to get just numbers back. You have some kind of a graphics for that. And then we have, uh, we have a coordinator, the DSDM coordinator, and then we have access to some cluster. It can be more than one, in fact. But right now, it's only one. One cluster, and here is a radio signal. Yeah? And this is very high volume. Yeah? So what happens then is that the client specifies a continuous query and sends it to the coordinator. And I come into the details how this is done later. But basically, you use these templates to define it. The coordinator, when you say compile, the coordinator generates a logical distribution graph. This is a data flow distribution graph describing how to do the computation. And the system knows then for a given query how to parallelize it. So here it is using this template to generate this logical graph. Now, you want to run this. You say run. And the first thing that happens is run is that the coordinator download the code to execute that graph into the working node here. It starts four working nodes in this case. It downloads different pieces to the different nodes. Well, it starts them first, and then it downloads. Now it downloaded. Yeah. And here we can see, uh, well, you can get an idea of what is happening. It's doing uh, partitioning here. We have two partitions. This is partition 0, partition 1, so partition. And then we do parallel computation here. In this case, it's fast Fourier transform. It's not the normal one, it's FFT3 because of this antenna which had three dimensions. <laughs> and then what, uh, what you want to do is to merge it together. And this is how you get speed out of FFT because FFT, if you parallelize it, you can get good speed out of it. Okay, so we install it, but you can do that in different ways. And um, here it runs. And then it starts to flow. So data flows through here and you get the initialization in the other end. But everything is completely dynamic. OK. And this is how a node looks, by the way. So a node has an engine, the query executor, and it runs a loop to receive the logical windows. And it schedules them. There are some incoming. There's an interface called the stream consumers. And here we have an interface to what they call a beam. Beam is the astronomer's word for radio signal for me. Yeah, yeah. you look at the beam. Yeah. So there are two beams coming in, but it can be another GSDM node. And the result can be an application. You know, if you looked on the previous page here, this one. No, so that one. Uh, you see application here, or it can be another BSD node. And uh, uh, the interface. One, one quick question, yeah, please. yeah. Is that being the merge data from the separate antennas, or is that each separate antenna? Uh, <laughs> good question. Uh, the, actually, if you look at how it is really done in practice, well, in, in the Swedish project it is one antenna, yes. In the, in the Dutch, I think they have a station where, where they first do some combination before they sell it to the central computer. But this is, up, I mean, the problem here is also that you can configure these things very differently. And this is part of the optimization problem. Where do you want to run what? And where do you want to collect what? All I wanted to show with this picture is that we have something like an engine that can, you can have interfaces to input stream, your interfaces to output streams, and you can combine them in any, any. And then the problem, the optimization problem is how many of these are you supposed to start, where and when? Yeah. And by the way, plugins are very important because you have to be able to plug in your same code, your, your, your application C code here. Okay, so now the data flow distribution templates is basically high level primitives that you provide where you can define your own access execution strategies. You can, for example, define, as I will show, how to parallelize FFT. In, three di in two different ways. <laughs> uh, and now it turns out the following, which is very interesting. A, a data flow distribution template can be independent on what you're going to compute. And, uh, and, and uh, for us, that's 
something which is built into the system. It, but we can look at it like a customization too, you know, the generic one. And we have defined one which is called window distribute. And this is actually what people are doing with distributed databases. We do round robin, you know. First stream, first window did, there, then that, then that, then that. Yeah? So it, 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 by round robin, it distributes the window and does the FFT parallel in each window. Well, the problem with that is that the window is not smaller. So the FFT will still be slow. So it turns out that if you have something advanced, like even such a simple thing as FFT that everybody knows, <laughs> Uh, you want to like to do the partitioning customized. And so Windows Split allows you to do your own customization here. And now it depends, what you want to do is to split the big window into smaller, and this depends on the algorithm you're running. And in, for FFT, there's a special way of doing that. For other algorithms, it's a different way. So that's Windows Split. And then the interesting thing is that you combine it all into something called the, the, the PCC, Partition Compute Combine. It is very, very common that what you want to do is first do a partition, then a parallel computation, and then a combination, as I showed. And it turns out to be just, this one is defined in terms of the others. And this is what you normally use. So we provide PCC, but actually PCC can then choose. You specify what, what variant of PCC you have. I come to that. So stream curry function is where the computation is being done. Here I just have on a very high level, in fact, definition of such a, a, a stream query function. Stream query function basically takes the content of, of one or several logical windows, combine them, and produces a stream of logical windows. And what we want to do in this case is we take the current window, one input stream, in fact, and then we apply FFT. Here you see X, Y, and C. Remember, we're three-dimensional antenna, so we want to do it in X, Y, and C coordinates. So we pick up that component of the window, we put a timestamp on it, and we compute a new radio window. But the main computation being done here is a single FFT. Now it's a regular FFT suddenly. Three, it's three regular FFTs in our case. Yeah? So we have, a, that's why we call it FFT3. Very simple. So this is a very small program, in fact. Of course, somebody has to implement FFT, but that's well known. OK, so uh, the idea here is to define customizable distribution templates. And the continuous queries are defined as compositions of stream query functions. And what the system does is to assign logical sites, patterns like this. Yeah? And basically what a DFDT is, it's a constructor. It is a constructor of this structure here, data structure. You want to say we want to do something here, and then this connects to that. So you basically just construct this graph. So it's, it's actually a very simple program. And uh, PCC. Is that it's very very it's a parameterized constructor. Constructors take parameters, and it 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 it, it can in general construct these kind of patterns. You know? And you want to scale here the number of parallel computations. Of course, then you pay a price here you know? <laughs> and a price here, and and this you also would like to parameterize. You know? uh, if you wonder what this 256 is, that's the size of the window. If you do this um, round robin thing. It turns out what you're doing is you send the same window size. So if it's 256 in, it's going to be 256 on each FFT, and it will be size 256 out. Yeah? OK. And this is how you use it. So uh, it was also on that other slide. You know. First you say, I want to do PS PCC. I want to use four nodes. I want to do this stream distribute. And it takes as par parameter round robin partitioning. Yeah? That's a function. Yeah? All our functions. You, you take the distribute function, it takes our, our partition as a parameter. And then we want to apply in the middle FFT3, and then at the end we will do S merge. And S merge actually takes a little timeout parameter 0.1. See? The parameter can be functions or it can be numbers. Yeah? And then we define the stream, and that's rather straightforward. We want to read this to some input stream, it's called radio, it's some kind of radio, radio signal. It's on that port or, or uh, host address, and it's a UDP. Yeah? Because that's what they deliver, the Lewis project. And then there is a, uh, on one, two, three, five, we have the visualize. So that basically is a, a, it is listening according to some kind of visualization protocol, which we implemented then. Yeah? And then you compile it. Compile this, uh, this query with this input and that output, and you want to run it on this cluster, which is our cluster computer. It's a Linux cluster we have in Uppsala. Huh? And then run it. That's it. Question? Yep. Uh, can you dynamically determine how many nodes you've used, or do you have to statically set that for uh, So you said it sets four nodes there. Do you have In the plain PCC, you do do that. 
at the end, I will, I will mention that we have done yet another one, which, which actually dynamically does it. But typically, this is also determined by how many resources you have. It, it, this is a thing, you know. At least that's the way it works in Uppsala, is we have to reserve a certain amount of nodes. So we have to know, in any case, how much resources we have. So in any case, you have to set an upper limit on how many resources you have. Will that change during the session period? Uh, not on our. Well, that could happen. That could happen, but we, we do not support that, and we don't have that in Uppsala. We have to pre-allocate all the resources in Uppsala the for the moment. Please. Yeah. Repeat the questions. Question. Ah, the question is, can it dynamically change under, uh, the number of nodes during runtime? Not in our current implementation. And furthermore, the way we use the cluster in Uppsala, we have to use the cluster. We have to pre-reserve how many nodes we can use. We have, we have a certain allocation of nodes. So, uh, and typically what you would, in any case, to have a maximum number of yeah. uh, From my understanding, I have to call the English stream into like the four nodes that you'll be using on the cluster before. Copy. Yeah, it, it streams. Yeah, but, I mean, do you, Copy, did you say copy? Like, do, do you have to, to transmit them somehow to yeah. the four nodes? Yeah, you, you see TCP, yes. So you'll, yes, so you'll have like four copies on four machines on this cluster. Of the window. Of the window. Of the window. But yeah. not the no, absolutely not. Okay. Absolutely not. That's why there is a loop, you know, on the here. Okay. Um, there are some requirements now if you go to the uh, partitioning, like for FFT. First of all, uh, if you're going to do a, a parallel implementation of, of fast Fourier transform, uh, it better return the same result, or at least approximately the same result. Yeah? And furthermore, in difference to relation databases, another important thing with streams is we have an order. <laughs> they come in an order. We are not going, we don't want it to reverse order of, of, of uh, logical windows, uh, necessarily. And for, for it to be good in any case, you know, it has to do some kind of load balancing, you know. If one node is doing all the work, we haven't gained anything, <laughs> obviously. And uh, so examples, and window distribute and window split have this property. Okay, so uh, let's do the first simple one that everybody knows about. Run, Robin, window, distribute. This is a generic method. It can be applied, it's used in many uh, hmm, distributed databases, very, very standard. And it is SQF independent, independent on what you're going to do. And the only thing we're doing is to distribute the logical windows to different nodes depending on, in a round robin fashion. And then the computation is being done in parallel on those and then it's collected. And Basically, we have a, a generic function S distribute, and we, we here is a partitioning function, and it's computation, and then the merge, and the timeout. So basically, it, it consists of, of three, three parts, a distribution phase, a computation phase, and a merge phase. And this call will generate this graph. And once again, you know, our, our part is a user-defined function on the next slide that says this is zero out of two, one out of two. So every second goes there, every second, second goes there. The size of the window is going to be the same all through. This is how you define it, trivial. It basically says it's a sliding window. That's very important too, by the way. And you're sliding with a certain step. So you take a, a certain amount of data and you get an array back. And then we, we select the nth, the P and O number out of that array. Sliding window basically collects the incoming stream elements into arrays of a given side and then jumps forward. But that's it, you know. Select P and O out of P toot, yeah, in the sliding. Of course, the sliding window is built in. Okay, so window split is interesting now. It is dependent because now we want to customize this. We want to do this, but we want to do it so we can we can use uh, use it for the FFT. Now FFT, you cannot you you can use window distribute doesn't, but it will not speed up as much as if you can make the window smaller. And it turns out to be something called the F FFT radix algorithm that allows you to do this. And, and now we do the partition according to FFT radix. And basically, it is the same, but the only difference here is PCC, but we use something called operator split and operator join. And here, the partitioning function is called FF3 partitioning, and this is fun, it's called FF3 combine. And these are much more complex than, than just round robin, because round robin just selected. Yeah. So here, basically, what happens, and it will do FFT partition 0 out of 2, 1 out of 2, and then uh, do FFT3 in, in same FFT3, and then the combine. And here, it's using the combine function as an argument. And an interesting thing here now, if the in, incoming size of the window is 256, here there will only be size 128. 
And since you know the complexity of FFTs n log n, this is going to be faster. Yeah. But the problem is that uh, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not at all uh, application independent anymore. And here is how FFT3 part actually is implemented or looks. Basically, it takes a window and it, put, it picks up the x, y, and z uh, coordinate, and then it applies a user defined computation here to, to pick up, actually picks up sli uh, elements in a certain order. And then it forms a new radio window. So uh, this is only on the higher level how it is done. The real work is done by this FF3P part on, on one. But as I said, it's XYZ, so it's three, three times FFT. But you get the idea, you know, you define your own partitioning function. And the interesting thing now is that to really make this powerful is wherever you put a function, you can put a template. <laughs> so suppose you want to make this thing. This is actually PCC, S distribute, we run Robin partitioning, and we are calling PCC in the middle. And it gets this argument. We are doing a two here, distribute partition. So it's twice recursively doing distribution in two. So now you can see what you can do here. You can create enormous patterns here <laughs> very easily. But since you can call it recursively. Now, if this is faster or not, it's a different story. But there are cases where this is faster. Now, it turns out in our case here, it wasn't that necessarily, but could be. And then I think then we get rather small windows in the middle here. Uh, the, what you can gain here is because we uh, speed up the distribution phase compared to the other one if, if there's a high cost on distribution. And the same for merge. You get more balanced. On the other hand, you use more nodes. But you get the point, you know. By having this recurse, we can generate extremely complicated uh, patterns. Compare this to relational databases where it's more chaotic, you know. You, you try all kinds of orders. <laughs> here we have a certain pattern generator. And it's only constructors. Yeah. Let's go on. So we did some experimental result, and they are, we did window split, window distribute. Actually, central, by the way, it's another template. It's, it's really, uh, the distribution is null, and the, the join is null. <laughs> yeah. So uh, they are all expressed as templates. So centrally execution, we get a very trivial uh, special case. And we did some scalability. We, 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 we actually, on the measure in the paper, was only uh, maximum throughput. But we have also, we can change, you know, the, it depends on the metrics. If you want to do delay, we can do that as well, which has been done, in fact. And what the astronomers want to do, they don't want to use two, only 256 size. Because remember what they do, they have a raw signal, and then they do Fourier transform. They want a frequency spectrum. And then you want to tune in the frequencies you're going to look at. And, and the bigger window you have, the more you can tune. So you, the bigger window you have, the, least, most in, more informa the more information you have retained. You lose less information. So what we would like to do is to scale the window size. Yeah? And we scale it quite a lot to 16K there. And then, then this is heavy duty. And we measure the impact of communication and, and, and computation. And another thing is the speed of the algorithm does matter. And we did this rather simple. We took FFT and we introduced some artificial delays in it. So it became slower to see what happens when it gets slower. Yeah. <laughs> and this is uh, the first. Here it's just uh, two, you know, split uh, what I had on the picture. And not, you can see central is slower, apparently. And uh, window distribute is slower than window split. You don't see, uh, well, it, it, uh, it depends on actually how much. We didn't slow down the algorithm more uh, enough eventually. If you had slowed it down more, the difference between these two would have been great. OK, so now we did degree four instead. We split it in four. And here we also tested the three, the one, the recursive one. And uh, it is still the slow computation. And it turns out that if you look at the array, when, when you have small windows, uh, the window split wins. And you know, this is exactly what they do in distributed databases. You have small records. Yeah. Window split is a good, uh, uh, which is a standard round robin. It's, it's standard distributed database splitting. It's good. But once you start to get into complex computation, once the computation starts to matter, then the window, uh, the, uh, the window split wins. Window distribute wins for small records. Window, window split for big, yeah? in your big windows. And uh, one can also see it here, you know, that. Uh, window distribute is slower here. On the other hand, the problem is that the partitioning combined algorithms 
or more complex in this case, yeah? because it was very simple partitioning and very simple combination. So the, the, the thing is, the, the, more, the more work you have to do, the, the better it will be to use window split. OK, we, uh, we did also with a, with a fast, highly optimized implementation of FFT3. And here it starts to show that actually the tree is best. <laughs> Uh, on the other hand, then it's not so heavy computations as before. Uh, and the, uh, you also see that for small, well, it is, if you think of it, it's the same picture, it is just shifted. <laughs> and we can just deal with much bigger windows now. That's the main difference. So for small windows, you still have the distribute is better, but for big windows, and the bigger windows, the better it is to do split. Yeah? So apparently there is a trade-off uh, between one or the other. And uh, one can also see it here on these graphs that the, uh, the bigger the size, the more overhead you have on the FFT. And this is because of the complexity of the FFT. And, uh, and then uh, the, the split algorithms, the split uh, partitioning starts to pay off. OK, is that clear? Here we have a, plotted it where, uh, where you see how much is the speed up compared to, to uh, central case. And you see there's a window of opportunity. There is a window of opportunity for the um, uh, window distribute here. But when it goes larger, it is bigger. By the way, you see this point over here. That's a tree distribution. Uh, the problem with, with the tree distribution is you use much more nodes. And, uh, uh, and the thing is, you would like to do the split strategy when there are some limitations on how many nodes you have, if you have some computation limitation. And so you have, have a trade-off here, you know. If, if you are doing too complex uh, or too big patterns, you're using too many nodes, and uh, then it might not pay off. Depends on how many nodes you have. Um, yeah. Now, if you want to look at related work to this, first of all, um, there's a whole bunch of work done on, on data stream management systems recently. And Aurora is probably the most uh, famous one. Well, I shouldn't say that. It's one of the most famous ones. It's uh, Stonebreaker and company on the, on the East Coast. And there's a stream project at Stanford on the West Coast. And there's a Gigascope at AT&T. And there's a Telegraph CQ on the West Coast by Stonebreaker's former guy. And basically, the first generation data stream management systems, they were all central. It was like a central database, but they deal with streams. Uh, so the main difference here is to have a distribution and that we can do advanced numerical computations. We are not just dealing with simple things. And you can have large stream windows. Uh, interesting is recently people have been starting to look at parallel stream database systems. And there's a flux at Berkeley on the east coast, on the west coast. And the Borealis is the uh, successor of uh, Aurora on the east coast. And basically, what I've mostly been looking at is load balancing and fault tolerance. And the main difference is that we are looking at these expensive computations and how to use customized uh, distribution templates. And um, then, of course, in the distributed database field, they have been dealing with partitioning for a very long time. And they basically have only generic ways of doing it. And they always assume small windows or small uh, data records, run robin hash and range. In our case, we provide that too, you know. That's just another customization. Conclusion. So um, we have been looking at how to do uh, continuous queries where you have uh, expensive user-defined functions. And it's not enough to just implement them in C or something. You also have to specify how to distribute distribution patterns. And this is done through this language or constructor, set of constructor templates we have where you construct the distribution templates. PCC is, the, is one generic such one, which is a very common pattern when you first distribute and then combine. And it is yet another one only. And then, uh, it is uh, then you use that in combination with either window split, which you can use for any function you want to compute, or we have done a special one. No, window split is, is uh, computation dependent. And we have implemented it for FFT Radix. And we measured on that. Window distribute is a generic one that will be in, in, a, uh, in a distributed database as well. And this is in application independent. The split is dependent. 
the, the split is, uh, is good when you have exp expensive functions like the FFT, which is slower when you have big windows. Whereas the distribute is pretty good for small operations, it turns out. And uh, where actually the size of the window doesn't influence the speed of the algorithm. That's about that. So you mentioned something else. Here we have, now uh, this has also been done, in fact. You can define another template called opt. And here, uh, opt, you do this in, we, I wanted to optimize PCC with, with respect to FFT3. And what does this do? Well, it looks up what are the templates defined for FFT3, and then it varies the parameters. And it runs a profiling program. It stores the profiling data in a database, in the same database, in the coordinator. And then it chooses the cheapest one. And OK, you know, this takes 10 minutes. But then you run it. <laughs> yeah. Why not? So that's how you, so you can do specialized optimizers this way. And it's, this is not complex. It's about 200 lines of code or something. So I want to try to uh, talk a little bit about another very, the continuation of this, a very exciting thing called Cisco Supercomputer Stream Query Processor. And uh, as I said earlier in the LUFAR project, this is mainly together with LUFAR. The other one was primarily in, co uh, in collaboration with Lewis, but they, these projects are together. And they have uh, then this IBM Blue Gene, which is a very different kind of computer than we have been used to before. Not very much, but somewhat different. And we want to do the same thing, you know. We want to do scalable search and processing very high volume data. And this is scientific data, certainly scientific data, astronomers. So it's the same application area. This is how it looks. <laughs> um, so it is really standing there and how it looks in running, in fact. Uh, what is special with this uh, new computer is that it, first of all, there are 12,000 processors in, in Holland. But Lawrence Livermore, you know, they have 125, 128,000 in Lawrence Livermore. That's the biggest one. I think this is the biggest in Europe. So 12,000 uh, processors. Now, one problem with so many processes is, is uh, energy. It generates a lot of energy. So what they have done is to deliberately make them slower. <laughs> it's only 740 or something megahertz. Uh, so they are rather slow. Uh, but that also means that every processor only uses 10 watts. You have to compare that to a PC. <laughs> Just 100 watts. So they're rather slow. However, it turns out that it's a fantastic communication between them. It's a gigabit network between them. So it's, it's very, very fast communication between these nodes. And uh, you have about half a gigabit, a gigabyte of main memory in each node currently. But that can be increased. Yeah? Uh, another thing to make this lightweight, this system, they actually do not have full Unix at all on this. They have a, a subset of Unix, but it is really a subset, which is very nice. So, if you don't use certain things, you can run your standard Unix program, yes. And so, uh, but you cannot use threads. No, no. <laughs> uh, you, uh, there are different kinds of nodes, in fact. Some nodes are specializing in communication with other nodes, and some nodes are specialized in communication with the outside world, and some processors are, are doing computation. So you can, you can do different things on different nodes. And there are different kinds of communication channels. So you can choose different ways of, communi of, of communicating between these. So there's, a, there's lots of tools here. You know, there's hammer, lots of hammers. But you have to know how to use them. And the way some people do this is they do an assembly program you know, to, to, to make a very, very fast implementation on the blue gene or whatever they want to do, like some kind of signal processing for LOFAR. That has been done. You know. um, and also, it is said by IBM, I heard that said, this is not designed for mainstream DBMSs because it's, uh, it's much better when you have asynchronous processing. And it turns out that this is what we have, <laughs> stream processing asynchronous. Uh, I should say something more. The, the, uh, the particular blue gene they have in Holland is specially, uh, is specially configured for stream management. What that means is they have a lot of in, uh, incoming connectors, yeah? what they call the gateways. Uh, uh, but um, routers, yeah. So, so there are a lot of incoming cables, basically, into the computer, uh, and also out. Uh, much more than in Livermore. What I heard is, if you try to do the same with with 100 and 120,000 uh, processors they have in, in Livermore, it will be very high cost. You know, so th there is a trade-off here. How many nodes you can have, depending on how many input connection you want to have. So. Um, 
And this is how it, how it really works, which even makes it even more interesting. You see on the top, top there, we have the input streams from the antennas now distributed over Holland. They go through this fast uh, ethernet into a backend cluster. And the backend cluster is just a regular Linux cluster, regular uh, IBM Linux cluster. And then there is a fast connection between the backend cluster and the blue gene. And in the blue gene, this data reduction is being done. And then reduced data goes to the front cluster. And then the user will see it. And now in our case, you know, we are basically submitting stream queries. And it is going to start up nodes all the way, no, not in the, uh, not in input stream, but from the back end on the blue gene and on the front cluster, and all three of them. And these are going to communicate with each other. Yeah? And both the front and the back end are Linux, regular Linux. And here you can see how, what are the components. What we call preparators is what this pre-filtering being done in the back end Linux. And then we start a bunch of, of SP here, stream, stream processor, or that's the same as working nodes in GSDM. And there is a coordinator, a compute node coordinator, which starts this. And one of, uh, and this is stream, the, the big arrow. And there is a query master which collects the stream and sends them over to the front stream processor and then over to the client. And here typically you do visualization, here you do data reduction, here you also do some data reduction. Uh, one particular problem with BlueGene is that you have to start exactly the same software on all nodes. Yeah? It's the same, these are identical uh, executables. And, but this fits well with, the, with our model because what you do is same, we start the same executable and then we install code that is being interpreted on each node. So, uh, so even though they, 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 are, they have been thinking of it like have, running the same software on each node, on every node, we are able to uh, run almost anything. By the way, uh, they're using MPI here, native MPI for communication, which is pretty interesting actually. And there are lots of hooks here. So research issue here are, <laughs> you have to include hardware specification in optimization, like how, how to use the communication in a good way, how to s use the different node specializations in a different way. You know, the, you do a different thing on the back end, in the blue gene, and in the front end, for sure. Uh, and then you have these uh, limitations on the, on the OS and what are the opportunities. You know, there are no threads, but instead of having many threads, one can use many processors instead, yeah? So it's very cheap to have more processors instead. And you have lots of main memory. And you want to optimize the streams across several different clusters, and you want to do com customization exactly as we did in DSDM here as well, actually. So that's it. Yeah. The system deal with the crashes, you know, crash. Yeah, crash. Yeah. That, is, that is not an issue here. <laughs> you restart it. Yeah. What? Crash. How we deal with crashes? Crash. Crash. No, we are not currently dealing with crashes. In in uh, this has been uh, of course studied in, in the data stream management system area that they talk about how to recover streams and, and one way to do that according to the literature is that you you have some backup nodes. That. You can mask crashes, but that would mean that you would have to do something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so do you do any stacking of like window split, window distribute? Because split's good for big data sets, right? Yeah. So you can split down the smaller ones and then yeah. distribute. Is that what you do? It is. Uh, you we, the we, yeah. Do we do any stacking? Yeah, like do, like do a level of split, split, and then distribute on the window. Uh, I think what you mean, uh, maybe what you mean is this. Is this what you mean? That you can stack them on each other. Right, right, right. Yeah. So, um, but this is a template. I mean, this is by, by just uh, using a template recursively, we can, we can, uh, we can do a, a staged split. Is that, is that what you meant? Right, I, I'm saying, did you do any tests where you did a split and then a distribute? Uh, first, a so split. first do a split and then do a distribute. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, that you can say. Well, what is the difference between split and distribute? Maybe that's the problem. In this case, it's going to do a split here. Well, it is split. Uh, what is the difference? I don't understand the question. I think. What is the difference between split and distribute? Right, because split's doing a radix FFT, right? Yeah. And then distribute's just going to do a regular FFT, but on each window. It's doing the round robin push, and then it does a regular FFT. Exactly. Uh, so this is the overall 
uh, in distribution algorithm, yeah? and it takes a parameter attribution function. And this one has the knowledge how to do the partitioning and when to call the customized partition function. Did I understand? So it's this one. Okay. I mean, uh, I know you have something called MapReduce here. So, uh, <laughs> uh, and of course, from, from my point of view, that is uh, another kind of distribution pattern, actually. Yeah. All right. More questions? So, uh, thank you very much uh, for attending. And uh, you can watch it again on Google Video. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Tor.